here on a Friday. And happy new year, everyone. I am Tamir Alphonse, and I am the industry head of Google Mina. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, when I was discussing with the NCR team a couple of months ago about the timing of the session, about Friday morning, second week of the 2024, impossible to find 10 people. And you proved me wrong. I actually was totally up. And now this is for me the most busiest session that I've seen on a Friday morning. <laughs> so really, I have to say that. So well done on that. And this shows how this topic is top of mind for everyone, how we want to learn about Gen AI and how this is important for all of us. And funny enough, if you Google Gen AI and the same topic of uh, this session, you can find how many results? Can you say a number? <laughs> Gen AI as a keyword is 32 million. And the result, the, the topic of the session is almost, we're talking about 400,000 uh, results. But these are all articles and people sharing their uh, feedback about the topic. But you barely find a lot of people who've done a profound research about this topic. And that's why we are extremely thrilled and happy to have you, Peter, here. Uh, and Peter is the... Sorry, no, I, 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 I thought that I remembered the whole bio, it's so long. But, yeah. So Peter is a chair professor of strategy and innovation at INSEAD. He served uh, a deputy uh, dean and dean of innovation from 2013 to 2023, 10 years. Uh, he has led all the major departments at school, including the flagship MBA program, executive education, fundraising, and faculty and research. And finally, he's an expert in deriving business value from technology uh, with a focus on digital and AI. Please welcome Peter, and we're very happy to have you here. Very good, thank you. Good. All right. So great, thanks for coming out, apparently on a Friday morning here, that's, that, that's really great. Um, I have a bunch of stuff to share, but obviously this is a fresh, open topic. So we'll also look to make it interactive um, certainly save some time at the end, but once I put some things on the table, shoot your hand up and either steer the conversation where you're going to find it useful or share your own experiences and views as, as we dig in. Um, just a little bit about me. Coming off of 10 years, um, so I for a long time have taught and researched on strategy and innovation, but then for 10 years, colleagues asked me to do that for INSEAD, so launching our online programs, opening up in San Francisco, um, actually, out of the um, our, our, our Abu Dhabi campus, we, we built some amazing capabilities in VR cases, some of you may have seen. Um, but in September, I stepped back. It was, in some ways, too exciting a time to be busy with that and, and too much to look at. Um, one thing that, that informs um, what, what I'm bringing to you is that even with all those administrative duties, I kept teaching about how you get business value from AI through the, the, the great um, uh, power of online courses. So I would record all my lectures, and then, but then I would regularly have calls and, and dialogue with people about what the current issues were for teaching that. Again, I, you know, I'm at Google, so I don't wanna say too much about Microsoft, but I, back, I, I have collaborated with them over the years. In 1890, so obviously teaching that course um, you know, in 17, 18, 19, there's this explosion of interest in machine learning and AI. Um, did a Microsoft, did, anyway, did a big um, online course with Microsoft about business value for AI at that time. So really into that. Um, just to give you an idea, like in the course, I, I track what are the technologies that are relevant for you. So thousands of students every year. Um, October 22, so I picked this one because this is, just before, right, ChatGPT starts launching and you know, the, the hype suddenly explodes in, in around November. Um, but already, just remember, you know, 69% of the people, this was their top one or two technologies, their company they were grappling with. So this was already like dominating the space and Mindshare, June of 23, 87%. So it's, it's like Gen AI is a wave on top of a wave. Um, again, the Gen AI stuff is new where I, I, I'll have things to share. I'm, I'll show you this in a second. But what I'll, I'll talk about is both what did we learn about getting business value out of 
traditional machine learning based AI. And, and that can inform to some extent the challenges that we're expecting to see. And I, just to say right up front, you know, what I don't know, again, where people are sitting, obviously a bunch of you are sitting in Google, which is a you know, born digital company, typically well positioned to get value out of AI, but at most in legacy companies, huge hype, lots of money being spent, often like, you know, big multinational billions on replatforming their data, um, getting their systems right. And yet the returns at the typical company were zilch, right? So you, although there has been amazing value creation from AI and machine learning, um, lots and lots of companies have struggled with it. And, and so that, I think it's important to understand what has gone wrong there to see and not repeat some of the mistakes with Gen AI perhaps. Um, great thing about Gen AI, how many people play around with prompts and stuff here? How many? Okay, not, not surprising, not everyone, but yeah. it's a super easy and accessible technology um, in a way. Uh, and, and so that I've been doing that, I, I, I'm in the midst of building a strategy assistant originally for my online courses, but, but I'm probably getting much more general, have started writing that up, like in this Harvard Business School um, HB article. So, you know, just a great technology to get your hands dirty, talk to other people who are experimenting with it, and I'll, I'll certainly share my experience there. Um, so let's rewind slightly. I don't know if you remember, before ChatGPT, there was this global pandemic. Yeah, okay, so, so just, as a, just to go back then, Let's talk about uh, briefly a bit of the experience with machine learning and stuff in, in the pandemic. So you remember this shit, right? This is recorded, is that right? Yeah, okay, great. Um, um, actually, you know, I, I should mention one other thing. Maybe before I, before I dive in, I wanted to say a few things. Um, I'm actually based in Dubai for this month. So when I step back, um, I'm taking two years of sabbatical, um, which is a wonderful thing in academia. And um, this month I'm based here and then I'll be going to um, Kennedy School actually. And we'll, because of some of the small social issues in technology today. And, and we'll certainly want to touch on that. And I'm curious your views on that. Um, although I'm based in Dubai, you know, one of those great INSEAD moments, 10 hours ago, I was in London. So um, if, I'm, uh, if I fall asleep, just throw something at me. No, I, I got sleep on the plane and I even showered. So um, I, I won't get too close, but I did shower. Here we go. Um, so let's go back to the pandemic. Do you remember, when did you first hear about this little COVID issue coming out of Wuhan? Do you remember? Early of, so, yeah, so certainly like for me, early, it was really early 2020, um, the WHO came out with their warning in January. Um, but if you were awake, people were signaling there was a problem already at the end of, 20, of 2019. And actually, one of the first groups to send a warning about something in Wuhan was a little AI shop in Canada called Blue Dot, if you look them up. So this is the, you know, the miracle of AI, basically a bunch of epidemiologists that had been hit by SARS. And if you remember, you know, Canada, really lots of Asian tourists, they got hit early and they're like, this is crazy. We should build an early warning system. So they did. What you do, they gathered all kinds of data from around the world, you know, social media data, government reports, and they trained it to look for the patterns of new outbreaks of, of major new, new diseases. And sure enough, 2019 Blue Dot in Toronto, boop, 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 pneumonia, strange pneumonia-like symptoms have emerged in Wuhan. So this is the miracle of you know, traditional AI, that it can do this, sorting through all the data, finding these patterns. And yet, did that create much social value, right? Did, did that help? Knowing a few months early that COVID was coming your way, did it help, right? If you, you know, let's, New, Italy, New York, they, they knew this was coming and they did them no good. Why? Because you know, to get business and social value out of these predictions, you actually need organizational routines and processes in your human systems to act on it. And most countries had zero in terms of existing muscles 
to defend themselves against an incoming disease. The, the countries that did slightly better were actually those that had been really hit by SARS. So China, um, Australia, Singapore, early on do relatively better because they had this. So that's, you know, that's the exciting or not so exciting key punchline, which is, yeah, this is about technology to begin with, but then it quickly becomes about organizations and people and all of that management stuff that, that needs to go together. Um, and really what, you know, AI and Gen AI is a general purpose technology. You can imagine doing a ton of things with it. Almost anything, any activity you have, you can imagine some use case where these technologies will work. Your challenge though is, are those really good use cases? So for example, in Singapore, they, um, I don't know if you've seen these like yellow robo dogs off the shelf, pretty nice, not a lot of technology risk. They train the robo dog to see if people are respecting social distance or not. So, you know, you're sitting too close, the robo dog's gonna come up and say, please move apart, put your mask back on. What do you think about that as a use case? <laughs> Creepy, right? So again, if you, so I, I certainly, especially today, there's huge emotional sensitivities about computers and robots telling humans what to do in, in, in most societies. It, it's cultural, but a lot of people are gonna find this super crazy, creepy, and not a great use case. So this is like a typical proof of concept, yeah, kind of works, no one picks up on it. Again, what are we, just, just to finish off the, 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 the COVID case, something positive, what does a use case look like that does create value and made people a bunch of money? Well, you know, it, it's often not the sexiest thing, but here, um, the people making robo auto cleaners were well positioned. Existing product, channels to sell into. And again, think about it. If you were running a shopping mall or an airport in 2021, there's a lull in COVID, you're desperate to get confidence up, get people back in. So you go and you get, and they're just retrofitted. They put slightly different chemicals in the cleaners. They put maybe these UV lights on. And now you tell the local press, we've got this covered. I saw shopping malls that would give them names and park them out front at the beginning. Uh, but that's, you know, it, it's, you know, the, this is the usual thing. Everything we learned about from digital, which is what's the real job to be done? Is there a customer pain point? Are you solving it? Um, do you, you know, can you execute on it? That's what you look for. Guess what? Even in an AI or a gen AI world. In terms of, I was going to say, like, what's the number one mistake that, that you start to see um, in big companies doing AI? Two. One was they wish that they had the same systems as big tech companies. So they, like, everything well wired and and they spend billions and billions and years trying to replatform and um, don't get, and it just takes too long. They're not able to design those systems quick enough. Their people don't know how to use them. So that, that's one rabbit hole people went down. But the other one, maybe even more common, is you run out, you hire a bunch of data scientists, plop them in the middle of your organization, and they start fantasizing about all the things that, that AI could do for this organization. So concrete example, big airport, some data, big, big airport, bunch of data scientists saying, hey, we can, you know, AI, obviously very good at image recognition. We can identify, there are cameras on every gate. We can identify what vehicles are there. We've matched it up with data on delays at the gate. We can now predict pretty accurately how fast that gate will clear, whether there are delays. So that, that's again, the magic of AI, right? You can really do these predictions. What's the question though? The question is, will that proof of concept scale? Will it really create value? And again, to do that, you have to do what? Well, what are you gonna do with the prediction? Uh, especially if you're an airport, you're gonna maybe feed it to airlines and try and reassign gates or get into their app so you tell people exactly when the baggage will be unloaded. Uh, maybe, but all of that is change. It's across organizational boundaries. It'll take time. 
And you really have to ask, you know, is that what you want to unlock? And so the, the biggest problem is, again, people got caught up there. I mean, I'm a big believer in general in experimentation and, 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 and proof of concepts. But this is certainly an example of taking that too far. You go out, you'd have dozens, literally dozens and dozens of proof of concepts, each of them with like a, you know, a potential value creation of a couple million and then be surprised when nothing scaled. Because again, there's a lot of resistance, it's hard, the business doesn't understand it, it doesn't seem that strategic, and it just falls through the cracks. Much more important is to you know, pick areas where there's significant or maybe clusters of use cases, go in, do the change management, unlock the value. Not only do you hopefully execute on that, again, the whole idea is, it's a change process. You're trying to build momentum. If you're successful there, like if you're working, I don't know, in augmenting your, your sales force, suddenly if that's working, the operation guy wants it for his supply chain and the HR person wants it for that. So it, it's important to pick your battles and win and show instead of spreading yourself too thin. I said, so guy, um, so yeah, so that's, that's key. Um, well, let me, I'll open up for questions or comments in just a second, just to finish on this, since we're at, at, at Google. Of course, you know, this, you need people who understand the business to work with the data scientists to identify the use cases that will create a lot of value, and number two, where the execution is manageable. So again, you know, what, you take one of the, you know, Big tech, obviously, and companies like Google and Facebook got excited by AI really early on because they had use cases like this, right? If I'm at YouTube and I can recommend the next video and you're 10% more likely to watch it, what does that do for my bottom line? It's an average, you know, the, the stickier it is, it's like it flows right in and it's a great use case. Um, it, it works really well. This is YouTube, but even, even if you look April 23, you know, you still see like Meta, anyone stumble into the rabbit hole of Instagram Reels? Anyone? <laughs> it's just it's one, of these, one of these sinkholes where they're gonna, you know, latch into the bottom of your spinal cord and get you just coming back over and over again because they're fine tuning this recommendation engine. And, and you can just see, um, you know, 24%, you know, uh, more time on it just because of this. So um, that's what you're looking at in terms of use cases. Again, um, Steve Jobs, I think when people write a history of our times, uh, there was going to be a nice meaty chapter on Steve Jobs. I think old people like myself, we sort of see his fingerprints. Other people may not, but I mean, it's not just the products, obviously the smartphone, you know, define the age in many ways, um, but it's this. It's the basic insight, uh, don't start with the technology, start with the job to be done. Um, it's, it's a pretty amazing, and that insight has to go here, right? So um, I'll just give you, here's an example stuff that people are struggling with today. Um, um, selling car, how do you, you know, remember buying a car, right? How price goes where? Well, you're, Typically in most markets, there's a dealership. You go in and you haggle with the dealer and it gets confusing. They're talking about these options and they're trying to make it sort of confusing and see if they can squeeze a little more money out of you. Um, is that the optimal way to price cars in 2024, right? So if you were going to get the data scientists in and imagine, um, you can do much better, right? So first of all, you know, you could have all kinds of algorithms that could really assess the willingness to pay of, of the people in front of you if you wanted to play that game. But the other side is you could also incorporate all the data coming off your supply chain. Right? Lots of supply chain problems today. Which models are easier to deliver? With accessories, do we have good margins and no delays? You know, that's child's play for a pricing algorithm today. So again, major European car companies decided, okay, yeah, we think this is a battle worth fighting, but they've taken like a key senior executive. His job for a couple of years will be, can you make this happen, right? Because it's not, you know, 
pricing happens at the dealership. You have to renegotiate the relationships with the dealers. You've got to do the change management with the actual salespeople on the floor and change their role. And it, it's not the algorithm. It's that whole transformation around it. Um, pause, questions, comments, is this? Yeah, in the back, I think we have mics. So we'll, if you just pause slightly and our uh, home audience can uh, follow sure. along. Yeah, please. Thanks. Um, so I just want to understand. What... Well, so if you say briefly where, if it's relevant, where you're coming from, sorry. Sure. Yeah. I, I NCI'd alum, 2000D, so I'm a bit of a dinosaur. <laughs> I run an exec search firm. Um, we get involved with uh, headhunting Great. for emerging markets. Um, so the, obviously, and I, this may be a preemptive question, so apologies Great. if it's too early in this uh, session. Um, we find that obviously there's lots of AI tools right now, for example, trying to help, let's say, candidates apply for the right job to make sure they modify their CV, modify their LinkedIn mm. profile, et cetera, right? So there's lots of stuff happening. But at the other end, when you're screening, you're also now going to use AI to kind of screen out all that stuff. So in the end, and when it comes to your example of the pricing for cars, for example, mm. yes, the car companies will try and use AI to optimize pricing. But just as on the internet, when people are comparing prices of you know, flights or whatever, there will be tools to help the consumer on the other side. Yeah. So in the end, doesn't this just become a very expensive zero sum game? So, um, it, so I'm a big believer, you need to have these principles in mind and then look use case by use case. So clearly, two comments. Yes, in some applications, like where you're gaming to get hired, it could be an arms race and you could actually just waste everyone's time doing that. Um, other applications, you wouldn't have that same level of back and forth, but that would be one thing to keep in mind. And then the second comment is, you should be thinking not only about what's the current way we do things and how do I optimize each piece like writing my CV, but then also you want to have a bit of imagination and now say, wait a second, this is going to change potentially the whole way this works, where when we redo this function, what will it look like in a new world? So you could not only be asking how do we optimize each step, but suddenly, you know, I think as you're alluding to, why even have the candidate write the CV so we can unpack it. They're just tools that do that. Maybe we should just take that stupid step out. But, and, and, and then you need to think about, okay, well, that's a vision of where it's going. How fast will it move? Can I get advantage by leapfrogging to it? Those are some of the great strategic questions today. So, no, no, that's good. I, as I said, we can take the conversation in, in different ways. Yeah, please. So. Yeah, uh, following what you said, uh, just take some steps out. Another example of pricing is, is Tesla. So I, uh, I'm sure there are some algorithms there predicting pricing, but what they've done is just go straight to the consumer. You take a deposit, you figure out what the demand is, you figure out what the demand is for, you make the most demanded item, the cheapest by area, mm -hmm. and it it works. And you remove all the dealership kind of, uh, how should I say, negotiation, mm -hmm. and uh, it works. So again, and you make the cars cheaper yeah, yeah. every uh, every few years uh, rather than making them expensive every few years. So, so it's, it's very a, it's, different, radically different yeah. thought process, no? Right. So well, how would I analyze that? I would say yes. Yeah, so Tesla, you know, thinking different, disrupting, and yet obviously the entrenched power of dealer networks and the difficulty of incumbents to move away means that the you know the direct in most markets we haven't seen those big shifts coming from Tesla. So obviously Tesla's had a big impact on EVs, their dealer stuff less. But then I would be asking myself, wow, with all this technology coming along, is the case for disrupting getting even stronger? And if I'm a traditional automaker, I should be revisiting that decision and thinking, hey, do I need to make the break? I'm not deep enough into it to, to, to be able to make a prediction. But is that, I mean. Yes, on the disruption, but what I'm saying is the disruption here is the way you do pricing. Mm -hmm. You know, the entire methodology well, of how you do pricing well, rather than use generative AI. Yeah, I, or, sorry, AI well, is not generative. Because uh, what I took from your comment was if I take the deal, like if I take the dealer network out, it's a lot easier 
to play and optimize my pricing and try new things. That wasn't your point? Okay, so my, my point was that you can try to do artificial intelligence prediction, or you can try to be innovative on the whole process and take out steps, right? Mm. So if you take out the dealership step, you, there is no dealer influencing the pricing, mm. and you go straight to the customer for pricing, you take out a step and it's a much easier yeah. way to do pricing than to start using yes. algorithms to do pricing, mm. which what you described seems very complicated yeah. for, well, for a cars, uh, cars, for cars. Interesting. Yeah. I, I would, well, we won't go too long on this. I'll just finish with my, my, my view, which is um, pricing is important. I think most businesses that have, you know, have rich data, you know, travel, these kind of things, you, you think about your pricing algorithm. These algorithms tend to be quite powerful. Um, having a direct customer relationship can make that a lot easier. Um, so that that's what's sort of top of my mind. Um, and and again, there's and still the question: What's the added value of the dealer that would offset those complexities? But we can, we'll talk afterwards. And I'll uh, try to understand better. Let me one more comment, and then I'll, then I'll I want to get to Gen AI, obviously. Yeah, Go for it. Okay. Hi, my name is Fadi Bayoud. Uh, I'm not related to Google. I did, I did executive development at NCAD. I have my own uh, advisory boutique called Strategic, An Strategic Anchors. Now, um, I come from academic background. I did my PhD 25 years ago in robotics. Now, um, semantics for me is important. I hope it's as well for you. Now, when we talk about artificial intelligence, AI, artificial is clear what artificial is. Now, when we come to intelligence, um, I think we might want to define a bit what type of intelligence are we talking about? Because defining it gives us control to what it can do and it cannot do. Mm. Image recognition, for example, has been there for 25 years. We, 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 we did it in the university back 25 years ago. It was there. Okay, now it's better. But now, what kind of intelligence are we after mm. so that we can say, okay, we are using AI, artificial, oh. artificial this intelligence, this kind of intelligence, because as you know, there are many types of intelligence and the definition of intelligence is not, it's not concrete yet, mm. because there are many faces of intelligence. So once we say maybe what kind of intelligence we are after, we might be able to better maybe develop systems, okay. solutions to tap that specific intelligence or a collection or... Uh, okay, so let me, let me respond. So, yeah, so... Um, there's a big danger, certainly in strategy. People use words not precise about what they mean, and so you can talk across purposes. So it's very helpful. Um, so yes, I get that. At the same time, we have to be careful. Two things: the um, so generative AI is moving very fast, and and so you know you you could spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to what's the right way to classify the intelligence coming out of ChatGPT 3.5 and you know wait till five comes out so that'll be one caution and and then the other thing is well, actually there's gonna have maybe two other great comment great question the other you know, another key thing is of course there's a lot of emergent intelligence coming out so one of the sort of the scary things about the transformers and this methodology is you're not even controlling what kind of intelligence it's building to, to make its prediction so i i think that 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 makes it even more tricky. But then I would bring up the following thing. Because again, at the end of the day, I come at this as a social scientist, as a business school professor. So when I think what kind of intelligence, one way I approach it is what is the aims? And one of the scary things, there's a you know, obviously a growing revisionist um, critique of Silicon Valley coming and emerging. And and one of the critiques is there's been this obsession with making people obsolete, right? So it's about automation, it's about replacing people. Um, where artificial intelligence is we're trying to recreate human intelligence. That's also what's scaring the shit out of people because it's moving much faster than people maybe thought and that's part of creating the, the um, some of the disruption and this should we push pause. I would just say there's another approach which is maybe we should develop you know, these artificial systems to make people better, right? How often do you hear people in tech talking about we're developing systems in ways to make people more productive and that that's our end? Um, again, I'm, it's not clear that that's as aligned with making big money, 
but if you don't want to rip up society and um, in all sorts of ways, maybe that would be a different way to think about how we should build these systems, which also will get into the experiments that I'm running later. So I'll, I'll talk about that. So anyway, yeah, this, this, this um, topic gets, can get quite philosophical and deep. Um, let me go back to, I'm just gonna make one last comment on the man, for those in traditional companies looking to get the value out. Um, like in digital before, the value comes where it comes from getting your tech people, your software engineers, your data scientists, your data engineers to collaborate with the people who know the business. That's where, that's how you identify the use cases. That's how you get adoption, you get execution. So here's just a, you know, at INSEAD um, we had in, we have courses, we bring guest speakers in. There's one that I quite liked. Imagine you're the chief data officer at ITV. So people know ITV, big media, they broadcast, they make shows um, out of the UK. They have tons of data, right? So you can imagine there's lots of data on, even like if you have a show, when do people turn it off? Um, view viewership numbers, cost numbers, lots of data. And yet an organization driven by creative people who don't naturally think about optimizing their creative processes based on, 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 on algorithms. So chief data officer is trying, he's got a management problem. He's gonna get these two groups together and part of what you, so it's communicate, communicate, communicate. He's gonna use the um, language of his community. So how many people know Breaking Bad? All right, so, <laughs> so here we go, that's one of their shows. So he's gonna, again, this is about crystal meth, we don't know, this is not a plug for crystal meth, this is a plug for good communication. So he, so if you know the drug business, you've got the people in the labs, the guy on the left, cooking up these drugs. But what you know, is just having the drugs alone doesn't create any value. You need the people on the street who can move the product, the person on the right. So he's basically making this point, you know, you guys, my data scientists, you're back there in the labs cooking up this fabulous drug. It ain't creating no value if you don't build bridges to the people um, in the business. So that's, that's, flip side, that's communication side. And then the other thing, obviously, um, you, you also have to educate people. So you, you're a, a big part of strategy is to use the tools and frameworks that we use to educate people. So he's now going back to his data scientists and trying to educate them about the business so that they can reach out. So here, this is just a basic value chain. What are the activities inside ITV? And he's saying, we have because it's complicated. We have a studio and broadcast. They do different things. And here's the key point each of those serves different end users, right? When we, we, we might be creating value for advertisers or for viewers or for a TV channel. And as a data, if you can understand that to some extent, you'll be better able to collaborate. And again, this is the stuff that just takes time, right? Educating people on both sides, building the relationships, you have to do this for the long run. Um, okay, we're doing okay. Um, so again, Mixed audience, so let's just see if we're on the same page around understanding what this is about. I'll, I'll try and go quick. If you want, you can slow me down. Um, so Google search trends. So imagine you know, you're know you following this. It, this stuff, although it's been around for a long time, big tech kind of wakes up about this and starts realizing there's business value here, 2012, 13, investing. The rest of the world starts waking up 2017, 2018. So you start to see this and you could, you know, search trends suddenly, machine learning, deep learning, shooting past AR and VR, and you start Googling it. And you see stuff like this. It's like, holy shit. I mean, this is not the most complicated math, but it's still, it's a lot of math. It looks kind of, and you read, but people, oh, you should just think about this as like a neural net or something. And, you know, and you, you could quickly get intimidated, right? And that's, that's, going to be disastrous because we're not going to get the value if business people um, don't embrace this. However, just remember, what do you need to build? You don't necessarily need to understand all the guts of this. It's like you need to understand the API. How does it basically function? Again, the more you can build a mental model with nuance, the better you'll be. But um, think about this. How many people in your business or, you know, you're able 
to design projects, apps, to leverage a smartphone. And I would ask you, how many people understand how this thing works? I would say, actually, is there anybody on the planet who understands from end to end? There are so many components. Like, there's people who spend their lives working on the gyroscope. You know, is it up or down? They understand maybe that piece, or obviously all the communication pieces. So, yeah, the technology is hugely complicated. But if you, at a high level, if you understand you know, what its, its functionality is, if you're a bit deeper and you understand where progress is coming from, like what is this, are the speeds getting bigger? Suddenly people are like, oh, we're putting an AI chip in the phone. You should be, oh, what's that do? <laughs> what's that gonna enable, right? You should be curious about the components, but you should never imagine, you can never wait till you understand the whole technology before you move, because you will never move. I guess we know that. So um, again, so people know how to build stuff. Okay, so here, I, 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 hopefully this stuff is now getting pretty familiar, but let me just run through it in case. Um, these are things I find useful at a high level for making sense of this. So first of all, AI is a disruption to traditional computer science, right? So traditional computer science was this. When I grew up, you wrote programs <laughs> so that you could combine the programs with some data, tell the computer what to do, and it would make an outcome, like make that person alone or reject or accept, and you'd have these rules in your code or whatever. What does machine learning do? Well, I mean, it just reverses those two. Right? I don't know if you saw that, but now I have data, their outcomes. I know who paid back their loan or not. The computer learns and writes the actual program or algorithm itself. That's as simple as that. It's, it turns out to be a big change, and people have been working like, like crazy on it. What does it mean? Traditional machine learning, it was all, you had to tag. You had to say, like if you were doing the image stuff, you need to say, that's an apple, that's not an apple. And again, this was like a huge problem in execution in most companies because you thought you had good data, you had data. You might have had lots of data, but it was crappy data, it wasn't tagged, it was split up all over the place. And and you know, if you if the data has has problems, the learning will be flawed. Um, and then the other thing, this is going to be really important also about generative AI, is it's statistical. So it you show it an, an apple, and it says, well, almost certainly that's an apple, right? What happens if I show it an apple with a slice? What's it going to tell you? I mean, well, actually, no, it, I haven't told you enough information. What do I, how, if this is, can this predict sliced fruit? What determines that? The AI. So the question would be, did you have data with sliced fruit or not? Right? If you had sliced fruit and you tagged apple slices, no problem. You're sailing right through. If not, then it's like, yeah, maybe, probably not. Yeah. So it, again, this is where at the high level, you have to have these sort of mental models of how the, you know, it depends on the data in certain ways. If the world, if the post COVID world is fundamentally different in your industry and you're training on pre-COVID data, well, you know, expect trouble. Um, so that's, these are the kind of high level models you're, you're building. Um, so again, you know, one of the, and this is really important for, for, for Gen AI as well, is there were lots of predictions about areas where AI would move fast and, and companies like Google are investing heavily in self-driving vehicles, right? And, you know, in theory, it looks great. And, and probably, you know, people are not, you know, we're not great drivers. So if we, you could probably beat people, um, but it turns out that's not good enough. <laughs> because again, emotion, first of all, emotionally, we're just not really comfortable when machines kill people, turns out. Maybe for good reason. <laughs> and so the tolerance for mistakes is low. So there was a fame, one of the Uber ran into a big problem in their project because of this, which is they had trained the algorithm on pedestrians, on cyclists, but not on pedestrians walking a bike. And some poor woman, not at a crosswalk, not great light, was walking her bike across the road and you know got got killed. Um, but you know, these these are the kind of things you're, you're trying to understand when you think about the technology, 
the strengths and the weaknesses so that you can pick the right use cases. That's going to be huge. And obviously, if you know about Gen AI, you know, making stuff up seems like it's more of a feature than a bug. So when you think about use cases, you, you, you know, if, if that's going to be a big problem, you either need to work really hard to make sure it has all the right data and it doesn't hallucinate, or maybe that's not the right use case for now. So that's, um, that's where we go. Um, again, machines are not that efficient at learning. Humans are, if you want to feel better, much faster at learning. So the, the only reason this works is because you need massive compute power and massive amounts of data. So again, the quick question would be, why are we so lucky that our time on the planet is seeing the explosion of AI, right? Why is it happening now? Because again, the methodologies of machine learning have been around for decades, but, but now's like the moment. Uh, but data, so, so, okay, so number one, why now, also why a surprise? Actually, one of the things that surprises me is how often the experts in the area are surprised that it's going so fast. So that, that's also an interesting question. Okay, definitely data. So, all the digitalization of our world has led to unbelievable, it's, like, it's almost like we were preparing this. As humanity, we put everything we knew, everything we created into digital formats so we could serve it up to the machines and it could now digest everything we've got. So we did that, so that, that's a big one. And, and then the other side is of course, that's driven by a basic economics, these are cost curves. The cost of a gigabyte of storage collapsing, but also the cost of compute, right? This is Moore's law, that's collapsed. Um, and, and then, okay. But the other one, why a surprise? How many people um, either grew up playing PC games or shelled out good money for their kids, right? This is your fault, right? Just to say, you did this, why, right? Because again, very, you know, billion, multi-billion dollar industry, one of the key things you competed on was what? Realistic graphics. Turns out you need specialized um, chips to do that kind of rendering. And this is a bit of the surprise. Someone discovered that though that architecture for chips was not only great at 3D graphics, but was close to exactly what you needed to do this kind of the math of machine learning. And when that suddenly it moved a lot faster. And again, now, and that, that, that's why NVIDIA you hear about them so much because they, by luck, were sitting in exactly the right place. And, and again, once this becomes a big industry in and of itself, now people, of course, everyone is putting the billions in to building even more optimized AI chips. So there, there's a huge amount of momentum in this ecosystem we, we can talk about. Um, there you go. Um, Janet, yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. Take, take the mic. Uh. I have a question. Maybe it's uh, quite late as a question. I don't know. But what is the difference between machine learning and AI? I thought huh? that AI is able to teach itself by itself, like a human intelligence. So, so again, you have to. This is this goes back to this the the idea. Of let's define yeah. things. So, for sure, let's slow down and define. And one of the things that happens for humans is we just start using words and we don't define them and people use them differently. So, and there's no, you know, Academy Francaise that's like telling you this is what the word means or not. So for me, artificial intelligence is a much gen more general term. Anything that makes machines look intelligent um, could, has over time and by some people been under that broad banner. So for me, AI, pretty broad early on expert systems where it wasn't the machines learning, but people were writing rules for the machines. People would call that AI at some point. So let's just leave that aside. Is it AI? Is, it, is that AI? Well, so let me, let me, so that you, there are definitely people out there over the years who've used AI for that kind of stuff. But it's so, not because AI. And, and let, me, let me finish. So now machine learning is a particular well, branch, say, of, of computer science, where exactly 
The machines, like I was saying, you get a lot of data, they look for patterns, they teach themselves. That's exploded. So now I do think a lot of people, when they talk about AI, they're talking about, they're, it's now oftentimes synonymous with these different types of machine learning. Um, but just be aware, you know, if you have a speaker, you might say, well, what do you mean by AI? So if I, yeah, go ahead. So Sorry, go. If you can uh, talk about example to be more yeah. specific or practical. Ooh. One time I was talking with my husband over the phone about uh, an e-commerce uh, platform. Yeah. He asked me if I ever shopped from there. I said no. And then the same day I received an SMS advertisement from that e-commerce shop is this ai for me it's not this is uh, this is a very uh, this is a spy from the machine learning so but ai <laughs> one one time i read somewhere that uh, machine annoyance uh, that that one of the ai tools uh, they they started talking language that nobody taught that AI how yeah. to talk that language. For me, okay, because AI is supposed to recognize the sliced apple, isn't it? So uh, that's why it's it's smarter, can be smarter uh, than. So I, okay, so just let me take your example. So inside your example, there is machine learning. So there are modules that allowed the machine to convert your verbal to text so that would be a classic machine learning algorithm application then there's they, a how did they get my my number oh no no because someplace in your privacy stuff you have allowed um you have allowed somebody i won't mention any names here I but you've allowed somebody <laughs> to to track your oral communication so you have somewhere you, there's a way to turn that off, but for you, that's on. And because they essentially, these algorithms let them listen and understand at very low cost pennies, and then they can turn around and they can sell that for, you know, even for 10, you know, 10 cents, they've got a great business doing that. Um, but yeah, so, but again, it's, it's a mix. This is what's interesting. It's a mix of, hey, there's this algorithm, that lets us, well, there's a technology that lets us listen in, an algorithm that lets us pull the content out, but then there's a whole marketplace, there's a whole set of things around privacy that determine whether or not they can monetize that. But that, that's the age we live in. I'm, again, I, I most, and you'll see this, I mostly come at things not, I don't start, again, it's tempting You've got to be curious about the technology and understand, but if you come at it from the technology, if you just, let's take another example. If you just try and really understand blockchain, and you try and understand like the NFT protocols on Ethereum, you can spend a lot of time doing that. It, it's okay, but it's not really going to tell you, does blockchain create value? Do NFTs create value? So uh, you got to have a balance between getting your hands dirty with the technology but fundamentally, you've got to think about what's the job to be done? Is this technology allowing you to do that? That's at least my how I try and navigate in this space. Yeah. Yep. I mean, that's good. So, uh, that's good. Um, so just you know, a few things on Gen AI. You'll hear about transformers. Um, I'm not going to get deep into that. But if, if you want to understand a little bit the just the the speeding up. If you went back a few years, you had all these different people working on different parts of machine learning. There are experts in vision. There were experts in speech. And, and basically, there was an important paper, I guess like coming out of Google, um, basically saying, you know what? All of these problems can be essentially transformed into something that looks the same. It, they all can look like a language. They all look like language. And what's the next word? That, that you would have in a series. So Gen AI, this is, this is again, I am sure there are people in the room, um, especially from Google, maybe with, with deeper into this, so feel free to challenge. But the amazing thing about Gen AI is again, we have to train it. And again, I said there was this big barrier which was tagging. This is an apple, this is a nut. 
generative AI, we're going to try and generate, create stuff. And we just train it this way. We say, hey, here's a text. Look at all those words. And now try and learn how do you predict the next word or the next sequence of words. I don't have to tag anything. I can just take all of that text data and train it. But the amazing thing is when I'm working on that problem, I'm also working on a related problem, which is the picture stuff. What's the next pixel? Or the music stuff, what's the next note? And that in some ways these different research communities came together and it just, you know, more scale, more speed, more resources. And that was again part of the acceleration here. Again, you don't need to know too much about that, but it all comes together. Um, again, if you're not, it, yes, you see the text stuff, but right next to it, the photo generation. So this is a, some photographer who won a prize for this photo and then revealed, no, this wasn't an actual photo. This was something created with a lot of prompt engineering, if you haven't played around with that. Or, you know, we, you know, you know, you could take, what's your favorite song? What's your favorite artist? Like that, your artist can sing his song. It's, it, 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 that, that's part of our world. But there are other things like you can train these computers to look at a, your brain scan and actually can back out what you're thinking with the right data sets. There's all this Wi-Fi bouncing around this room. We can match that up with the camera data and it can actually learn just from the Wi-Fi signals and how they bounce in where the people are even without once you turn off the camera. So it's, it's incredibly powerful stuff um, that is flowing really fast. And, and in, if you think about um, like the spring of 23, where you start seeing people, I, I've never seen people deep in a technology suddenly walk out of the lab and say, holy cow, let's, let, maybe we should wait. Because, but again, they were seeing things that they probably thought were a decade or more away that were popping out. And, and, and that, that's just the moment we're living. Um, uh, at, at the same time, um, now that it's passing to the business world, a lot of people are like, you know, at first you play around with Jet GPT and think that's amazing. And then if your boss comes and says, oh, can you redo the marketing function raised on Gen AI? Pretty soon you're like, holy cow. Uh, but just let, let's think about, you know, you're at Campbell's. Uh, so there are examples of people playing with this sort of stuff. You're designing a new, um, you know, pie soup for the American audience, okay? What would you usually do? You'd have to like, have a bit of a concept. We're going to go do focus groups. We're going to write the focus group script. And then, and after that, we're going to generate some sample products and ads and see how they respond. Well, suddenly, what can you do? And you have big teams, like vertical, you know, specialists in focus groups, specialists in, in the media. Suddenly, you can go to chat GPT and say, I need to do a focus group for, you know, Thai soup for Chicago suggested question. Well, that was pretty powerful. Then someone was like, you know what? Why, you know, ChatGPT has read billions of Facebook posts probably. Why do we actually have to go to a fa you know, focus group? Let's have it create a persona and say, okay, um, Puerto Rican mother of two in, you know, uh, Evanston. What does she think about this product? It'll, it'll give you an answer. Now, again, is it right or not, right? It, it, but but it, it's doing that. Then, Obviously, not only can it generate the, the, the advertisement, but it could actually say, oh, could you personalize this to that persona? Um, so that would be powerful. If you think about it, though, to, to make that transition, you still need people. There's gonna, we're not, it's not going to do it all by itself. You're going to have people in it. But the set of people, the way you organize it, going to be completely different. It's going to be much more integrated, one team, end-to-end -end doing this. And, and that's where I think... A lot of businesses are like, holy cow, how, how do we make that transition? And, and at the same time, how do we not freak everybody out that we need to actually deliver the product today? And, and I think people are, you know, we're, we're, that, that's part of the thing that's going to pull the hype down for a little while. Um, but, it's, it's, but, but again, it goes back to that exchange we had. You, you know, you should be thinking, even if it's not coming next year, if you understand what this technology can do when you had a blank piece of paper, how would you design your marketing department? How would you design your HR department? How would you design your search process? 
and having some view of where it's going, uh, again, that, that, that view will change because the, the technology is moving, could be really helpful um, in, in, in making decisions and thinking about, like, timing's everything, as we know. When might be the moment to make a move and, and really uh, like maybe disrupt? That's the era we live in. Okay, so um, I wanna now share sort of, so again, as I said, this is stuff you can just do. I was at, um, I went to, I'll talk about that later, but I, I went to uh, Las Vegas uh, for AWS reInvent. Sorry about that, but, the, but although I, I, I did some, <laughs> Google did some great advertising. I have a photo of that later. But anyway, well, you know, just, just to sit in and see what cloud, I mean, cloud is gonna be huge for this, right? So the, the, the I mean, open AI and that, that, but the big battles are gonna be between Google and AWS and, and, and Microsoft on, on the cloud. This is a huge driver, obviously, of demand for the cloud. Anyway, um, but just hearing people asking about, oh, can it do this, can it do that? And basically the experts were like, you know, I don't know, but guess what? Let's pull up a laptop, let's try. It is just the kind of thing that it's quite easy to experiment with. So, okay, here's a little, um, a little framework um, as I think about this. So listening to people, what, again, this thing can hallucinate, it's not perfect, it does its best. Sometimes its best is amazing, and sometimes its best is a fantasy. So one of the things you're looking for is, oh, is the output good enough, basically? Is it hard for humans to do, right? So is this, are we saving a whole bunch of time? And even though it's hard for humans, can they check it pretty quickly? Because that, that's gonna be reassuring, right? Humans in the loop. Um, what's a great example? I don't know what people use this for. Summarizing a meeting, right? Action, I mean, again, if you use this stuff, it's, I mean, depend, if you're good at it, it's maybe that hard, but for many people, writing up minutes from a meeting is a bit painful. Um, AI can do it super fast, and you can check it. You were just at the meeting. You look at the notes, you can quickly adjust it. It's a great, great kind of use case. So that, that, that's one thing. Um, then in terms of implementation, what are we learning? Um, prompting makes a big difference, right? So it's, it's trying to predict, you, you give it a question, it's trying to, based on the question, to predict what the right response is. And what's in the question will change everything. And if you say, you know, imagine you're, you know, an NCIAT MBA student, how would you answer this? It would be different than if you frame it differently. And so that the, the prompting, um, we can go into that, matters a lot. Again, for a whole set of reasons, keeping humans in the loop probably pretty good. You, 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 and, and finally, a lot of the value is not just the, everything you go off and do prompt engineering, the real question is how do you build systems around it? It's not just the AI, how do you link it up to you know, sending actual emails or doing things, and, and so that's huge. So here we go, um, so that's, I will then share sort of what I've been, one of the projects I've worked on. Um, can Gen AI do strategy? So here within this framework, um, what do I see teaching? is, so I, as I said, I teach these big online courses, I give people all the frameworks, I say, okay, now apply it to your business. You know, people find it really useful, those who get through to the other end. The biggest pain point is, oh, it's taking so much time, right? And again, if you're, if you're a non-special, you know, if you're, you know, if you're an INSEAD MBA working at, you know, Bain for a couple of years, it's, it's easy. But if you're just a, you know, regular person, I say, hey, do the customer journey. It, it, it takes a lot of time. At the same time, if you're in a business and you understand the tool and someone shows you a draft, it is much easier to react to that. So that, that's why we thought this could be interesting. Is the analysis good enough? That's what we wanted to test, right? So that's, and that's what I'll, I'll show you. Um, in terms of implementation, we have this. Um, well, what's interesting about strategies, those are what attracted us, is we have a whole bunch of frameworks and tools. And you can think about other places where you have this. And so you can take like the blue ocean strategy methodology and you can, sit, you can use that to build prompts. You can explain to people, this is what you're using so they can interpret it. Um, so we have all of that stuff to inform the, the prompt engineering. However, um, really, and this is really informing what we're trying to do, you wanna keep humans in the loop. And that is 
super important in strategy because the challenge in strategy is not formulating a clever strategy. It's getting any decent strategy executed in your organization. And you know, a classic criticism of consultants is we bring these bright kids and senior people in and they come up with this really bright PowerPoint deck and they fly away and the organization has no ownership and maybe the consultants didn't really understand some of the execution challenges. So although it's probably possible over time to build brilliant systems that will do just what McKinsey did and come up with this thing, if you cut people out, you're gonna lose the ownership, you're gonna lose the insights about what do we actually need to execute. So again, what I'm gonna show you is an early attempt to build a system that will work with people and get them into the process and, and, and actually feel ownership for what comes out and hopefully have um, something more effective. Um, let me, why don't I, I can come, well, well, let me just do it in this order, but I'll be quick, because I, I really want to, seeing is, is what it's about. Do LLMs understand, the, does ChatGPT or or whatever, does it know what a complement is? Does it know what a rival is? Yeah, this is, it, it has ingested all this stuff. If it doesn't know basic concepts like that, um, it wouldn't be able to talk with you. So it's got, all the concepts are there, no problem. The question was more, how much sector specific? If I ask you, wow, but I'm in, I'm, I don't know, I'm doing M&A advisory services, does it know who, what the substitutes are for that? Um, and, and so that, that was one of the things. That, the quick answer would be, you'd be surprised how much stuff this thing knows, and it's only gonna get more. So. The, I, I, Again, you'll be able to play around with this and, and you should play around with this kind of stuff. But it's amazing how much is already in there and that's gonna get even more. Um, so in terms of what we did conceptually, you're gonna see, so we start with the strategy tools and concepts. We use that for prompt engineering, but then we basically build a user interface. We're trying to have a way for people to interact. You don't have to do your own prompt engineering. That's sort of behind the scenes. You can interact with the output. And at the end of the day, you know, it's sort of, it, it'll build the slides for you at the push of a button then. So you, there's a whole bunch of automation coming. Um, one thing you know about prompt engineering is sequencing can matter. So it can be really important to say, okay, what are the market segments? Okay, the, 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 the user says, yes, those are my market segments. Then, okay, well, give me a personas within that. Then, oh, take that persona and ask what they think about the customer journey. It can do all that, right? So this is the kind of sequencing that we want to put together. Um, again, this is easy. This is just an API call, but then you just have to do basic digital stuff. You need to build sort of cloud infrastructure to do that front end. And, and so that's what we're, we're playing around with. I'll come back to that later. Um, so let's see if, um, hmm. Well, let's, I'm on a Google machine, so. And, making it do PowerPoint, so I apologize for that. That's probably my bad. I, I, know I, how to, I know how to do this, share this tab. All right, actually, oh, you know what? Actually, that's, um, I'm sorry, let me share this tab. I wanna put this, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, let me put this in context. So, um, uh, so this would be like slides from a class. So you're taking a class with me. This is my original use case. I'm, I'm saying, Industry value chain. So the industry value chain shows the key activities involved in producing a product or service and how they're connected. Really basic map, but when everything's changing, it's a good map. So I would, I'd give an example like hotel industry. You don't, for those who don't know, this would be a basic industry value chain. Owners and operators of hotel, they sell to travel agency, their trailer, people influence them like travel guides and a bunch of suppliers. You might go a little bit further. These are the market segments. Those are the, um, the, the key competitors um, and blah, blah, blah. You could then do things where you could look at how this value chain changes if the internet, Expedia comes in, um, owner operators go directly. You could do even more fancy stuff like how would we put Airbnb into this? Well, it's a you know, whole new activity cutting out the whole thing. All right, but what I'm starting with is just, I'm now gonna ask you as my student to do 
a value chain for your industry. And you're not, you know, an INSEAD MBA or a Google employee. You're just, you know, you're working at ship.com, which is true, ship.com, a small tech company that helps people at home ship products on e-commerce sites. But you're, you're not working there. Now you're told to do this. Well, the idea is going to be um, we're going to help you get there. So here we go. Let's see if this works. Dink, dink, dink. Um, all right. So we're on, there's a there's a login page. We I've already logged in. Oh, no, wait. Here we go. I'm there. Okay, so here we are. So a bunch of tools, and we can, if you're interested, we'll, we'll, we'll share this afterwards. So value chain. So this is, again, um, so let's say, I don't know, I'm, I'm doing banking. So the, the first thing I want to do, because I know people who are maybe new to strategy, they don't always get the scoping right. So banking, that's ridiculous. That's too broad, right? Um, so what it's, the first thing it's saying is, you know what? You said banking. It's got all these products. It's got everything from private banking to wealth management, um, and these are the leading companies. And you're like, oh, okay. You know that? I, I, I'm really, I'm in, you know, credit, agricole. I'm in retail banking. Boom. And then, um, okay, now that that yeah, checking account, savings account, Wells Fargo Bank. Yeah, that that's my world. Um, so that'll be one. Let's do something manufacturing so something a little more niche but still pretty mainstream so truck manufacturing let's check that um okay so pro yeah heavy duty trucks you know but just note it you know refrigerated reefer trucks i mean it, it it's a there's no specialized knowledge here this is just raw chat gpt4 in this case um light duty trucks all that electric and hybrid trucks and it knows yes these are these are key companies so Again, so users involved, help me make a value chain. Chink, 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 chink. So now it's going to go and hopefully, yeah, here we go. So it's starting pulling things like a list of potential suppliers, distribution channels, customer segments. We're purposely making the list a bit long. We, we want people to go in and pick the right things. Um, we, we allow that we might miss something so you can enter things here. In, in time, we'll, I mean, we're capturing um, their, their responses now, but in time, we'll build feedback loops so potentially the algorithm could get better and learn. We haven't done that yet, but here we go. So I'm building, uh, yeah, I want my steel supply, electronics, that's gonna be important, um, and whatever. Uh, distribution channels, dealerships still, we're still going through dealerships, I don't know why, but, uh, uh, but there's some, actually, I've got a direct sales team, We'll do this. We're doing both um, for you. Uh, customer segments, well, they're definitely fleet operators. Um, they're uh, actually rental people. Uh, good enough. And inf who influences? I have no idea. But maybe there are some vehicle review YouTubers. I'm sure we have everything on YouTube, right? So there we go, just for you guys. And yeah, Volvo and Isuzu. Um, let's see. All right, now let's see. Oh, I wonder if this will work on your machine. So chink, chink, chink. Oh, okay, we're going to, you're going to, Special, I'm using his machine, so here we go. We're saving. Okay, so let's see. Open it up. Uh, oh, that's too bad. Um, there's only okay. So I'll, I'll let me go back. So we'll have to do this uh, because for the recording, we're using a, a Google machine, so it doesn't have everything on it. It's okay, no problem. Doesn't have evil things like pop up. Yeah, it's okay. I'm gonna. I have a slide. It's okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's, uh, let me just see where I'll, uh, yeah, yeah, where, here we go. Okay, so, so just to say, duck, duck, duck. Anyway, so in, oh, wait, let's share here. So I'll just move here, don't worry about it. Anyway, you can see how the system works, but basically make PowerPoint, and then it, it creates and opens in PowerPoint if you want, the slide. And again, so it's for the students who don't have the PowerPoint skills often, they would immediately have a first draft, you know, in the same format and coloring that they saw in class that they could start playing with. Um, to keep going, so this is a general methodology, so that's doing basic industry analysis. But one of the things that Gen AI is best at actually is creativity, a little bit of a surprise, right? So it's not necessarily, it's not a source of truth, but it's a great source of ideas and variation. So we also plugged in 
a whole bunch of blue ocean strategy pieces, which I'll show you now. So let's suppose, I don't know, I'm private equity. I've bought up a big, I'm doing a roll up of chains of dry cleaners. And I want to think about fine tuning the strategy. Um, so dry cleaning, if you know blue ocean strategy, it's about a new value proposition. The first thing the student needs to do is identify the attributes. Why does someone go to a dry cleaner? And again, it's pretty basic, but yet it takes people a surprising amount of time and, and stuff to, to do that. And yet, I don't know if you take a look at this, it knows. It's a, again, it's a pretty good list. You know, convenience of location, quick service, quality of cleaning, friendly staff, specialty. It's got eco-friendly, it, 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 it already. And again, this will get better. So it, it knows all this. But then what we're doing so far is once you've got that, we're actually going to then not do um, the sort of fancy uh, generative AI. We're just going to do automation. So what we do is, if you know Blue Ocean Strategy, you take those attributes and say, OK, these are the things I want to raise. I want to be really good at eco. I want to really friendly. Um, but you know, I'm not to get that, I'm not going to be as fast or whatever. So you're playing around with these attributes, dragging and dropping, um, believe me. And then what's, what's interesting, Again, it, 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 it's, I mean, our philosophy is to keep people engaged, that people should, at the end of the day, own and be involved in the strategy process, but we were going to make it easier. So they're dragging this around. If you know Blue Ocean Strategy, this is sort of the industry as is curve. This is what people are currently offering. This is what you're building. And when I move something to create, it knows, okay, that's new. This doesn't have it. I eliminate it. it doesn't. So it's, it, and then again, push a button. And all of that's a slide, and, and so that's the the kind of stuff. And and again, the the other one is you can we also you can make personas. You can then have a conversation with a persona. What do you think about the new value curve? This is all the kind of stuff that's coming. Um, so again, I, I think you know why do we do? You just want to get a feel for what are the capabilities that are coming because it's going to change. The way we do our work, um, having it, you know, humans will still be in the middle of it, but you're gonna. This is just gonna make people more productive, but also potentially. I mean, one of our thoughts is this could make it easier to empower people in your organization to think about strategy. It's it's some ways a leveler. Question or comment? Question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, so one question from uh, for me is about the human element that you're bringing up and that will keep coming, right? Yeah. Uh, and one of the examples you gave is we still need the consultant to uh, execute, right? But at the end of the day, even mm. that execution bit you're talking about is a piece of data. And mm. with all the companies we have that are somehow similar, it's there is a pattern. So it's it, it will eventually become data. For mm. the driverless cars, uh, the one casualty that you mentioned that we, we all know about was less than the, uh, it would have been if it was the same hours of driving made by human. And traffic control is probably way safer with machines only than human being tired, no, making it's, it's very fast decisions. It's not clear that you need pilots in airplanes, right? They, they create a lot of problems. E exactly. So yes. the idea is at what point or what do we need to realize that, not, not to realize, but what is... What is it that's going to make the, hmm. the general realization that the human isn't actually necessarily bringing better value or more hmm. value than just reassuring other people that? So, yeah, so that's a big, that, that, that's a little bit about how society and culture is going to evolve. Um, I wouldn't bet on that. So, if I was building a business and thinking, um, yes, in five years, people will realize this. I wouldn't count on it because that doesn't seem to be happening. And it's going to get a lot of worse because as, I mean, some of these technologies are going to have big negative impacts on the careers of well-educated people. And the amount of noise in the system, the pressure on governments, on organizations is going to be, the emotions around this um, will be great. and and And, a lot of people will be threatened by this. So I, I think it's gonna take a lot of time. 
And indeed, so I mentioned I'm going to Kennedy School next. It's partly just because, you know, the anticipation already it's clear that government's more assertive and getting more involved in tech, but I, I think the political pressure for that will only build. So I don't know if that's yeah, yeah, so I'm not, no, yeah, so no, I, no. I get your point. So again, if you just said it's it's already a fact that there are people, many people dying every year because we insist that humans should drive cars. Okay. Um, but I don't see any big groundswell to do anything about that, right? So, um, yeah. So for, so for you, it's not really a matter of time because you're talking about the pressure of the government. In our company, we see the pressure of the stockholders, right? Uh, and, the, yeah. and the market. So it's like different types of pressure that are quite contradictory that at the end of the day, stockholders mm. were able to make uh, layout to 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 enforce layoffs, yeah. for instance. Oh. So, but got, it's, it is it is impacting already step, the job let, market. Let me um, let me step back because I think again, like I think it is. You have to work at it's well. It's it, we live in way too interesting times. On the one hand, you want to work at a granular level. How is this technology working for my use case? But also, you want to sort of step up and look broadly. Um, so, one of the things we know about digital. So, digital has transformed work, hasn't led to mass unemployment, right? But what has it done? It, it, it's great, but it has created increased income inequality, right? So there are real winners and losers. Gen AI looks to be just amplifying that, right? So if you're able to now, instead of managing a team of 100, if you can manage a team of 10 with 50 amazing algorithms, you're gonna capture a lot of that savings, okay? But what about if if it goes fast and, and a lot of people are hurt economically, um, they will use the mechanisms available to them in their society, whatever it is, to agitate for their interests. And the more, faster it goes, the more obvious it will be who's causing the problem. And, you know, big tech is sitting right there, right? So um, just, you know, you got to watch that space super carefully. Just if I really step back, um, you know, communism not, not has a great, didn't work out great. If you go back at the moment when it came in, it was, there was a reason, right? Early industrialization was making a lot of losers. Marx and Engels were looking at a world where people were ripped out of craftsmanship type jobs, moving to shitty cities in polluted, bad conditions, losing out, and they tried to articulate something that would be better because the market economy wasn't working for a lot of people. Now, over communism had its own faults, and eventually we got to places where the market economy worked better and better and better up until when? About 1980, when digital took over, and since then, market economy has been less and less inclusive. So, there are, you know, there, there are big forces at work. And if you, you know, people sitting in the cigars are probably, you're all winners in this digital economy. Um, but, you know, the basic, we have a basic agreement in society that you go to the labor market with your skills and that determines how much of the incredible wealth you take away. It's a great system. Certainly for the people in this room in general, it works pretty well. If that loses legitimacy, you can have decades of fighting about how we divide, you know, to say universal basic income, not so simple. Look at countries where you have big welfare state, look at the politics around it. Um, it's, it, it's worrying how fast things are going. I was, sorry, that was a long answer to a very important question. Um, well, that, that's that's um, pretty much why I wanted to share. I mean, the other thing, I mean, I, I at the end, I have, quite a bit I could say about the problems of AI, but um, let's take questions. Yeah, please. Hi, um, I'm not an AI specialist by any means, but <clears throat> I'm very interested in what you showed with the Blue Ocean strategy and the tool that you've developed. Mm. Have you done analysis as to how useful or, oh. you know, at yeah. the end it can come up with a lot of ideas. How good are the ideas and is it actually helping the people who actually do this on a day-to-day -day 
basis to perform their jobs better? Have you, have right. you reached that stage? Have you reached such a conclusion? Yeah. So it turns out, so there's a, not just our work, but so for sure, we started like going into classes where people had done it themselves and they were like, oh, wow. Well, kind of came up with the same stuff as we did. And then another student was like, yeah, but it did it in 40 minutes and, and we took a week. Um, there are, um, we can send out some links afterwards. Um, uh, very nice. Um, study at BCG, like several hundred BCG consultants, um, where they gave it, gave one group AI, one group not. Um, and for some tasks, big increases. And actually, super interesting this is what got our attention is they benchmarked how productive the consultants were beforehand. The consultants that were less productive got more of a jump, which is a sense, again, from an HR point of view, this is a leveling. Right, you have all this expertise right there. As long as you know how to listen and talk with the AI, it, it's a leveling. At the same time, they put in some tasks where the AI wouldn't be good. So there were some tasks that so we had to go from like a spread for different sort of medias. AI wasn't helpful, and in fact, the people who were given the tool were less productive. So again, that so there is again where the technology is today. Sometimes it will definitely help. Other times it will be a distraction, and, and that's what we need to learn. It's a great question. Yeah. Yes, hi. Uh, this is Wissam. I have a question about the value creation aspect of um, implementing AI in the large organizations. Mm. Then, use case. I mean, from what I have been seeing, uh, bringing AI into customer interactions for large banks or government can bring value to the company and to the customer experience on the other side. So customers happy, companies mm -hmm. saving money. So I yeah. see uh, there is a value creation. So like chatbot. So this is like a big step up in the functionality of basic chatbot type. Yeah, I, I mean it's a compelling use case. Yeah, but how? Yeah. how what's your views on? adapting the AI, not only for the customers, but also for the customer experience and for the business themselves. Um, so as I said, I, it's a very general purpose technology. Um, it, it really is a good one though to, to experiment with. So, I, but I, I, can you give me like a particular use case in, um, so like, what did I say? Um, so, okay, let's take sales. So, um, which I, one I'm looking more at. So for sure, um, ChatGAI can help a salesperson generate emails to customers. But it can also, if you have a salesperson who's got like a big portfolio, sometimes you might, some sales jobs, you might have a hundred, couple hundred clients in theory you're looking at. Um, Gen AI can sort of scan that, summarize it, call your attention to customers that you should maybe focus on. It looks pretty good at that. Um, if you if you work at the right systems and give it the data, so that's an example where at least for me, yes, it can be helpful to do the emails. Um, again, even better if you build systems where the salesperson can put in little hints like, oh yeah, this person is a big football fan, and it can quickly incorporate that into an email. And then same thing, it can help for running the business. How do I um, summarize what's happening with different customers and help the salesperson in those ways. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm trying to understand more about the Gen AI because in general, the value for AI solutions is great. Yeah. Like uh, the customer interactions, uh, the mm. law enforcement, the face recognitions, it's a great value for the, for the yeah. entire society. It's not only for the businesses or for the government or for the customer experience. But I'm still, because mm. it's still early, use cases for gen AI I mm. mean, to create a great value like the traditional yeah. AI use cases. Thank yeah, you. so, well, it's still, I mean, remember, it, if you look at like the traditional AI, it, it took a decade or more before we really sorted out uh, and a lot of the stuff. We're pretty early in gen AI. So I think there, just to be aware, there are two things happening. One is we still need to experiment with how does this work in practice? What are the right use cases? And at the same time, the technology is still moving fast. So um, the, you can, anyway, th these models will scale up so that what it can do, it, it'll be able to do a lot more in a year or two even so. So it's a moving target. 
Um, but you're right. We, there's a lot of uncertainty. That's why, you know, it like it's a it, it it's important in organizations to figure out have people experimenting with this, and then also build a network where you're communicating, finding people in adjacent spaces, build your professional network so that you can learn what's working and what's not. We're collectively we're discovering. Um, yeah, you got the microphone. Hi. Oh, hi. I'm, uh, my name is Shamala. I'm actually not from here. I'm from New York. I'm just here for a couple of days, so I'm so glad that I'm able to catch this session. Um, and I just want to respond to that as well and sort of tie all of this together. Right. When when I was sort of reflecting on exactly what we were discussing from the start to now, um, I lead the product design function at, at UBS. So one of the things as well that we are debating there is like, how do we actually make customer experience UX using AI, but I think the way I reflect on the conversation today, at least as the key takeaway for me is the, the traditional way of product design, um, problem solving, understanding the job to be done is not gonna go away. We still need humans. We still need to be able to sort of predict, mm -hmm. understand what are we really solving for across the customer journey before we start to then define what technology, what AI, what ML, uh, machine learning, can we use to actually solve for it? I think so, sometimes, in at least right now, given the technology is moving so fast, it's very easy for us to, as organizations, to say, we have this, let's let's hire people, put invest a lot of money, and make something out of it, which has always been the traditional flaw of companies when they put money on product design. Build a product, customers will come. Yep. And it's the same, I think, I think the same flaws that we sometimes are falling into right now. And I think the takeaway, at least for me, is we have to continue doing what we are doing the way we've solved for problems, but see where technology can solve for them, not the other way around, not starting with technology and seeing yeah. where the application is. Right. Am I yeah, yeah. thinking so like about a, it right? Yeah, so I, just to build on that, it's really for the people in the functions. If you're in product design, you should be experimenting with this and thinking about you know, where would this help in product design? What are my real bottlenecks? And and figuring that out, um, which I think is what, what you're saying. And, and we're not just gonna take a blank piece of paper and redesign everything. It's gonna be an evolution. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll show you in a second. Oh, okay, then a couple of things on product design, just what I'm hearing. So talk to like big automaker again. Um, so again, automaker, it very incremental. Um, your engineers have a certain way of thinking and they, they're coming up with new sort of chassis or whatever. What they're finding is the Gen AI will, is quite creative and it will come up with a lot of garbage, but it comes up with some really innovative stuff that humans get, wow, why did it do that? And then they'll, they'll, they'll zoom in. Um, so uh, yeah, you, you need that experimentation. And, and again, there's a lot of surprises in there. Um, there's some real nuggets where it's already quite good. Um, yeah, please. Uh, hi, Gillian. Thank you for being here today. Just a quick one. You mentioned I love the strategy uh, robot, uh, the strategy yeah. assistant. Mm. So this will clearly change or take some of the tasks that management consultant, radiologist, so many people are today. So this will change the job market. Mm. So being a mom of three young kids, my question is, what is your recommendation? What should we do? How can we actually shape our mm. kids today to be prepared for the future? Because this will naturally evolve. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. To jump on that. I think that's one great way. My, my son is, doing, is using AI to do his homework and his friends' that's homework. True. He's getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> and he's no. always searching for new AI tools. So, so really yeah, it's, yeah. So, it's so again, we don't. Um, so it's an open question. How will the role of humans? and that machines evolve over time, hard to know. Um, however, clearly I would predict purely book, I have one colleague who's like, he's like, I, I told all my friends, their kids should go into like data science. This is gonna be great. And he's like, now it's like, oh my, that's all getting automated. <laughs> so <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> um, so it, it's, it's definitely a moving target. So again, I. I don't know, I got four kids too, so I, I'm like, whoa. Um, uh, so I don't think anyone has the full answer, but but clearly getting them to experiment with the technology, so just, just making this part of their life and curiosity about it, can't certainly can't hurt. 
Um, in generally, this, this idea of adaptability, curiosity, it's going to be important. I think human, I mean, working with people on social um, and wellness is going to be huge, either because that's where a lot of the human value add is going to be, but also to the extent that um, machines are taking the load off of us, um, if, you know, you're going to get maybe less satisfaction in 30 years by pouring into your career and being hyper successful and satisfaction may come more from being a well-rounded person, but that's, that's a, a hypothesis. Um, but yeah, I think if you're one of the, if you're like a helicopter parent, like really obsessed with how your kids are going to be super successful and high status, this would be a very anxious time for you because <laughs> no one's telling you exactly what summer camp they're supposed to go to. <laughs> I don't know. I would say maybe relax and let go a little bit, but that's, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, let me just, I, I think we're, I need to wrap up. So I, I would just say, just I'll leave you with, where's the, oh, here we go. Oh, oh no, that's not, I'll just. Yeah, yeah, let me, yes. Oh yeah, I, I, I can, I have, I've given, but I'll just watch this, just in terms of the, what can the machines do? So customer segments for cinema, is it showing? Yeah, cinema, cinema, boom. So boom. Just, just to give you a sense, this new stuff we're playing with. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So well, afterwards, it's it's there, and it, as long as you give us feedback, ideas. But anyway, let's let's take questions. Oh, yeah, here we go. Well, so watch. So, you know, families with children. So maybe take your kids to see the movies. All right. So I picked the segment. Now it's going to at least suggest personas to you. So you know, play around with this, but you've actually got. Um, economical Emily and um, movie mom. And anyway, so you, you, you've got these different things. And at a push of a button, once I, oh yeah, that's, I want to see movie mom Emily. Let's send her, let's take a look at the customer journey. This will actually um, automate the creation of a customer journey you Can play around with this. Um, and again, it'll at some point somewhere, um, also talk about what Emily thinks about the customer journey. So again, the, the, the interesting thing here is you can take non-special, you, know, you don't have to have studied a ton of marketing. You can start using this. Again, we don't have this in yet, but you can also talk with the tool. You can say, oh, why, why when you did that, you know, why did you do the personas with this attribute? And it'll actually educate you. Quite actually scary for those of us who are professional educators. Okay, questions. Let's finish up. So just to elaborate on the uh, cinema customer journey, and before you were talking about the chief data officer at ITV and various mm. links in the broadcast value chain, but do you have any real life case study or examples, or do you know where I can find mm. them? Actually, you'll probably say just ask. Chad, and what, what are you looking for? But of companies that have monetized the uh gen ai tools huh. and, and power okay Re real case examples um well again this is all quite new where do i so where what am i watching i'm again it's generative super interested in the gaming industry so think about multi-billion dollar industry you see people doing great work on non-player characters um i'm looking at that adjacently i think if you think about in my field management education simulations role plays are huge um, I have a hypothesis, huge step up, looking to take some of that big investment coming out of gaming and, and moving it into management sims. But no, a lot of the stuff not yet, not yet validated. Um, you have to pretty much right now, what I rely on is talking to consultants or people in companies about the experiments they're doing and what's their feeling about what's working or not. Um, but, yeah, we have to, we're running out of time. So nice one, one last, last question, question and yeah. then we'll, so, yeah. Um, so Good. just last question. Here's a prompt for you. <laughs> you're speaking in a room in front of action-oriented CEOs, okay? Yeah. And you're presenting about the latest of AI and what it can do. What are your recommendations for do's and don'ts mm. that that CEO should do? Because in other technologies, it's kind of clear, you know? Some would be like, Oh, should I go now build a chat bot for my customer service? Other people will be like, okay, I need a strategy assistant. Other people will be like, oh, I should do creatives in my Gen AI. Others uh, will be uh. like, 
hire a chief AI officer, right? So what would you recommend is the best way for a large organization mm. to embrace the technology? Because as you said, it's quite subtle and it's broad, like mm. it's, it covers a lot of different areas. So, okay. so um, you proceed, proceed, but proceed carefully. So you definitely want to get parts of your organization that are experimenting with this. One telltale thing would be, has your there's a huge issue with having your people experiment taking your proprietary stuff and just putting it on open ai chat gpt so like there's a ceo has is your cio awake have they set up a you know a secure cloud place whether on google or wherever where their models running where your people can take their proprietary data and use it on this or not and if not, you've got a problem. So traditional companies have lagged on digital transformation. Everything from cloud to just the culture changers, customer focus, um, growth mindset. And consistently, you just see the way late, year after year, the value you get from making that kind of digital transformation gets bigger and bigger. This is just adding to it. So there's a piece is you've got, and that's a multi-year project. You've got to have a conviction that we need a certain level of digital capabilities. You've got to figure out what that means for you, where you're at, and move, keep moving on that. That'd be one action point. And then the second thing is get a few people around you who are plugged in, who are experimenting with this, talking to other people. What could this do for the company? And, and that get to the point where you can you know, identify what look like some big wins that are going to be safe and not hurt your reputation so that you can get some of those early wins um, over time. That's what I've got for uh, that. I'm out of time. Yeah. So thanks for coming out Friday. Um, and uh, thanks for being really interactive. And I think we spend the next 48 hours <laughs> to talk about this. I'm ready enough. don't have that. So again, I want to thank you on behalf of Google and everyone for this amazing presentation that is really interesting and scary at the same time. Mm -hmm. But thank you again for everyone to come. And please, I hope we can see you again in the next NCR Talks at Google. Thank you and have a lovely yeah. week. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's get that. Yeah, I just Right.